It's time we give back. Someone see and show someone where the love's at. Even if you don't give a damn, give your heart and share your time. Help somebody else in life give back. My name is Hosea James Gavan II, and welcome to this segment of Ignite and Power Transform, where we showcase urban superheroes that impact communities in the Bronx and around the world. We are here for part two of the segment with Dr. Mark Nason and his fascinating book, Before the Fires. And we just got through that last, that last show, man, and uh, we never got a chance to talk, but I, I tell you, Everything that you said touched me in a way that, like I said, I'm a student of history, and there's a lot of things that I'm learning now, and and I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm one of your, I'm one of your students right now, well, man. You know, you know, look, I, I, I was lucky enough to be in the middle of things which changed New York and changed the country and changed the world, absolutely, and to survive it because. Mm -hmm. Some of these things were, you know, were got pretty hairy, but um, it also allowed me to see things that I felt needed to be exposed. Okay. And this book, Before the Fires, mm -hmm. is telling stories that people had kept to themselves that they desperately wanted to tell, but they needed a university-based scholar mm -hmm. to give them the option of telling the stories to a wider public. Mm -hmm. They told it to their kids. They mm -hmm. told it to their friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that nobody knew at any university I was at was that there was an old timers day in the Bronx. Oh, yeah. The first Sunday in August That's where right. 5,000 people came to 23 Park and Cretona Park right. because they remembered what great times they had in those neighborhoods, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Because... Once the fire, the Bronx started burning. So when did that happen? When, when, okay, when the fires start the started in, in late 60s and went through 77 with the blackout. Right. When I was taking the uh, 3rd Avenue L to Fordham in 71, 72, I watched buildings burn from the train. Wow. Um, but what happened is the burning of the Bronx, which everybody in the world heard of, led to this really destructive narrative, which was the Bronx was this wonderful place when it was Irish, Italian, and Jewish, right. and then black people and Puerto Ricans moved in, and you had crime, and you had drugs, and then the Bronx burned. Right. As though black and Puerto Rican people moving to the Bronx brought a contagion of disasters. Right, right. And that wasn't, that erased 30 years of history where upwardly mobile black and Puerto Rican families moved from Harlem and East Harlem to the Bronx to find a better life for themselves and their children and found it. My mother was one of those families, and her family was one of those families that moved from Harlem to the Bronx. My mother grew up on Dawson Street. Right. And you actually had the opportunity to meet my mother who... Yeah. One of your one of the people that you feature in your book, Dr. Yeah. Harding, Vincent Harding. Oh, you want to, let's talk about that. Dr. Vincent Harding mm -hmm. was one of the West Indian people whose families moved from Harlem into the South Bronx, uh, into the neighborhood uh, Morrisania Hunts Point. Right. Um, that's where my that's where my mom grew yeah. up. So they, and were, he they went, were neighbors. He went to Morris High School where he was the valedictorian of his class in 1968 and talked with great love about the principal who's, who said, I'm making Morris a little United Nations and all the teachers who encouraged him. He went on to get a doctorate in history um, and also become a minister, and he was with Dr. King in Albany, Georgia, and Birmingham during those protests and he ended up being one of the pioneering scholars in the Black Studies movement. But he also he goes back to the Bronx to talk about what shaped him as a humanitarian, as a scholar, and as a visionary. I would like for our audience to take a look at the footage that I was able to get from you, from Dr. Harding, and your, your oral history with him. Mm -hmm. That also had a, a bit of my mom. Right. 
Okay, okay if sure. you don't mind, can we take a look at that now? Absolutely no one bothered you. So you were found completely safe yeah, yeah. everywhere. We never even thought about it. Like, if would you walk home from like Harlem at two, two o'clock in the morning, three subways, walking the streets, even though you knew some of the, the little fellas who were junkies. Once you few, they never bothered you. Nobody bothered you. Uh -huh. You never had to be afraid of being in a bar. Oh, mm -hmm. You know, I haven't been in a bar maybe in 40 years because of what <laughs> things that happened. But there you could sit and have a drink yeah. and enjoy the good music and just have a great time. You just, you wanted to make your family proud. Mm -hmm. You wanted to make your family proud. Plus you were interested in, so many, you know, interested in doing more. You know, I loved reading mm -hmm. American and, and Vincent used to be always in and out, right? And my mother could always find me at the library. Now, where was the nearest library to where to Dawson Street? Oh, and it was on Southern Boulevard. But the library was a very clear alternative space right. that was part of the growing up process. Oh. We just knew that that was someplace else where we could be, where we should be, where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. People on my street, on my block, the wonderful older women who were always looking out from their window or on the porch mm -hmm. saw me with this gang. Mm -hmm. And the word very quickly got to my mother <laughs> that I was hanging out with this gang. God bless and them. my mother would not have any of it. <laughs> so. The point came, I remember how long it was into my gang life, but the point came <laughs> when I had to tell the gang that I could not be a member anymore. I remember you I told them, get out in those days. In those days, yes, you could get out. But um, that was a part of that interplay of the life of the community and the life of uh, that gang uh, experience uh, coming up against one another, right. and the community won. I'm sure people thought that that was simply <coughs> part of what it meant to be a citizen right. and now, a member of the community. Now, now. That was some great footage. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, wow. It, that was one of the great interviews that, that we ever did. That's great, man. And, I, you know, when, when we first met, you actually remembered my mom, so that, that also touched me too, man. She's, she's a dynamic, dynamic oh, person. Oh, yeah. But she embodied all these people who had a great experience growing up in a Bronx where people of different cultures, races, and traditions shared everything. And also, these neighborhoods produced more varieties of popular music than any place in the country, if not the world. Right. So, And all of this was erased by the fires. And the whole purpose of our oral history project, the Bronx African American History Project, was to recapture 30 years of Bronx history where uh, there was this incredible sharing of cultures, sharing of traditions, and where a lot of black and Latino families were able to create a great place to bring up their children. Now, in, in reading the book, that the, the, red, the red diaper babies that you kind of refer to in Brooklyn, it seemed like there was some... Oh, so, yes. Some level of that in the Bronx as well. Absolutely. That, that's a really important point. Yeah. The reason Morrisania right. became a place where black families could safely move in the 30s is because the landlords knew that these were people who were socialists, communists, who had a social consciousness about race that very few other New Yorkers had. A lot of neighborhoods, if you were black and you moved in, you know, people would harass you, right. ostracize you, try to drive you out. Right. But not in Morrisania because of that anti-racist consciousness. Not among everybody, but among enough people. So the landlords actually put up signs in the 30s, we rent to select colored families. Right. And so you had the Pullman porters, the postal workers, you know, the upwardly mobile black and families moving into this neighborhood. And it created this wonderful environment for to bring up kids, you know. And my, my brother, if you can just 
I, I, I know we can go on. We, we got to take another quick break, and then we'll be right back. Hold that thought. Okay. All right. Lift every voice and sing. Michael Blake was responsible for the grassroots efforts with electing our country's first African-American president, Barack Obama. Currently, he is an assemblyman in the 79th district in the Bronx and is the vice chair for the Democratic National Committee. He's also my godfather. Bronx Black History Makers! Lift every voice and sing. Bronx Black History Makers! Jacqueline smith Bonu. she is an educator and jazz pianist. Her uncle is Thelonious Monk, the famous jazz musician, moved in with her family in the Bronx, a lineman place because of a house fire. Okay, we're part two of part two. Uh, we're going to uh, take some time and, and talk more about your book. And uh, one of the things that I found fascinating about your, your co-author is uh, Mr. Gums is that he was part of the Black is Beautiful movement. Absolutely. Can you share with our audience okay. about, uh, about that? Bob Gums was very involved with uh, the Black is Beautiful movement that Carlos Cook started in Harlem before the Black Power movement. This is the late 50s, early 60s. They were starting to showcase black models, the natural hairstyle. Mm -hmm. um, and promote jazz as a quintessentially black art. Mm -hmm. And several of the people were from the Bronx, like uh, Alumbe Brath, um, who, you know, they, there was a whole group, a lot of them from West Indian families, right. who were involved in this early form of the promotion of black beauty and black consciousness. Okay. And so they, they, they used music and, and, that, and, and that social atmosphere, the combination of, of, of music and art, I guess photography is art, Yeah. and, and they used that to help to, to push uh, a movement, because black, black is Beautiful, that was a, a major part of my childhood, Right. Uh, hearing about that, my, my parents really promoting that uh -huh. and making us feel like it's okay. A to lot of that came out of the Bronx from people who lived near where your mother lived in Dawson Street. Like, uh, Bob Gums was on Lyman Place. Wow. Where, by the way, the great uh, jazz pianist Elmo Hope lived, and Thelonious Monk lived for two years because his sister lived on the block. Wow. What people don't, what we, Bob Gums was one of the people who, when we started doing this research, said, do you know how many great jazz musicians lived in the, the Bronx, how many great jazz clubs there were in the Bronx, how many great music programs there were in the schools, that this community, which was totally forgotten by historians, was a, a, a hotbed of cultural creativity. Yeah. And it's, you know, all up and down Boston Road, there were about seven music clubs where all the top jazz musicians you know, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, you know. Lester uh, Young, I saw. Yeah, all played. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and nobody knew this outside the people who lived there. But as I said, this whole black and to some degree Puerto Rican experience mm -hmm. in the Bronx was erased by the fires. Right. And I was lucky enough to be tapped in the shoulder and said, Nason, it's your job to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do much but listen, record them, transcribe them so that we won't be forgotten. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a shame, man. You know, uh, it, my school where I work, with my day job at PS463, I'm a guidance counselor. My day job is in the heart of, of Morrisania, right? It's right, right on, uh, on Tintin Avenue yep. between Home and 168th Street. Know and exactly that's right where up, it is. And that's right up the street from Forest. And, and right in the midst of, I'm looking at the, uh, at the map. You do a map where you do a, a walking tour uh -huh. of, of Morrisania. And, and everything, all those churches and some of those jazz clubs are within two or three blocks of my school. Yeah. And right. also all the great jazz musicians who live there. Henry Red Allen. Red, Red Allen. You know, uh, Maxine Sullivan. Elmo Hope. 
Wow. Uh, and even the doo people, like the Chords on Jennings Street, mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. the Shaboom was the first uh, urban harmonic song to sell a million records. Wow. That you're surrounded by history, but it was history that was erased. And our job is to bring it back. And, and, that's and, the, and have the young people realize they're almost on sacred ground. And, and you know, that inspired us to do, we're, we're doing, as, as you're aware, and, and I guess you guys will be aware very shortly, because you've been seeing those, those Black History Month PSAs that we've been running, inspired by our, our guest here. So we had the young people do the PSAs. Why? So it becomes part of their life and Absolutely. part of their culture. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, this has been an amazing experience for me. Doing this project wasn't mm -hmm. my idea. Somebody tapped me in the shoulder and said, you need to do this. And it was a time in my life, my kids were growing up, I just finished a book tour, and I said, let me look into this. And that when you have people who've been waiting for years to tell their stories, and they'll sit down for three hours and have you transfixed, Right. With things nobody outside of their world knows, right. but which is important for everybody to know, right. you feel, wow, wow, this is a privilege. That's dope. And we've done over 300 of these interviews wow. in the last 16 years. So we're going to have one more segment, man, and we got a lot to cram into this seven, next seven minutes. So we may have to have you come another time, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll do our best. We'll be right back. Wow. Lift every voice and sing. Rob Black History Makers! Dr. Vincent Harding graduated from Morris High School as class valedictorian. He received his doctorate from the University of Chicago. He was a civil rights leader and worked closely with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he was a pioneer in the Black Studies Movement. Let us march on. Lift every voice and sing. Howie Evans was a sports writer and a sports editor at the Amsterdam News and a basketball coach. He was inspired after hearing Congressman Adam Clayton Powell give his speech. He wrote a story which was published by the Baltimore Sun and he became the first black writer at the paper. Welcome back to this final segment of Ignite and Power Transform. My name is Hosea James Gavan II, and I'm here with my brother. Because I, I, I'm calling you my brother, man, because I, I, I truly feel your love for, for people, man. You well, know? Thank you. And, 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 and culture and an appreciation of history. Mm -hmm. you know? so, and and we, can, we can vibe right on that, man. Right. We can Absolutely. vibe right on that. And you're asking me some great questions, and I think... The connection you made between the red diaper babies and the high school. Well, you made it in the book. I yeah. just read the book. Yeah. I couldn't, and I tell you, once I picked it up, I couldn't put it down. I uh -huh. was up at 4 o'clock yeah. in the morning right. reading this book. But, until but they, one until of the end. things that really hit me about this book was when people were talking about all the great programs in the schools. Every middle school and high school in the Bronx had 300 musical instruments that anybody who made the band of the orchestra could take home to practice. Imagine that, taking home an instrument to practice. A lot of the music teachers were professional musicians. You see, we... Um, Donald Byrd, the great Donald yeah, Byrd, yeah, yeah, was Donald a music Byrd. teacher at Wagner Junior High, and one of his students was Willie Colon. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, Edna Smith of the Sweethearts of Rhythm was a, music, uh, a bassist, was the music teacher at P.S. Uh, at Junior High School 40, which produced a lot of great jazz musicians like Jimmy Owens. And you talked about the talent shows that they used to Oh, my up. God. The talent shows at PS99. Right. Uh, Arthur Cryer said it was like the Motown of the Bronx. Right. And right. they sent people to, other, to, to New Jersey to talent. There was so much talent, and the schools nurtured it. Right. Uh, and the tragedy was in the 70s, all the music programs in New York City public schools were shut down in the fiscal crisis. See, that's, that's, that was when we had a major transition in, in New York City, right? Uh, you talked about the fires, but the, the culture of New York City 
somewhat took a hit. Yeah. Took a hit. Uh, and, and let me just say this. We created the National Give Back for Kids campaign. Trying to recreate, resurrect that spirit because to try to produce the same kind of opportunities for our young people. You talked about Howie Evans. I, you know, I never mentioned this to you, but Howie Evans was also my coach. I co he coached me wow. out in East Harlem. I was part of a program, the East Harlem Biddies, and, and Howie Evans coached me. So, oh, my God. Uh, he, he, I, I know men like him. He was a, he was a prolific writer. He, was, he, worked, he wrote he was the He was the sports writer for, for the, the Amsterdam, Amsterdam News. News. right? But he took time out of his, every Saturday to, to come to Benjamin Franklin High School in East Harlem yeah. to coach us. Yeah. Here. Well, Howie Evans said that the worst thing that ever was done to the youth of New York City was shutting down the Knight Center. There you go. That's, that's another oh, okay. one. Okay. When I was growing up in Brooklyn, PS91 was open 3 to 5 and 7 to 9, five nights of the week. All the schools in my neighborhood. Yeah. And these Knight Centers were were places of refuge from the streets, from the right. gang violence, right. from abusive parents, because right. they're, you know, and it was also a place you had talent shows, right. you had arts and crafts, you had basketball. Uh, PS 18, near the Patterson Houses, mm -hmm. who you had Floyd Lane, the great city college yes, player, yes, and Ray absolutely. Felix of the Knicks ran the Knight Center. Wow. And then you had the Parkies. Like Hilton White at Caldwell Avenue, who sent a hundred people to college, all these were shut down. They used to be every little vest pocket park. You didn't only have a cleaner; you had a, a recreation supervisor. They eliminated that position. Wow! In the fiscal crisis, they shut down the night centers. They shut down the music. All the kids who got through, who were mentored, and and got through hard times, now are out on their own. Right. Right. And it's even though things are getting a little better with community schools, I just spoke to one of my former students who's at Brandeis High School. They have no music right. in the entire school. Right. There are schools without any teams. Right. It's, right. This is a, a crime. So you're not you're not talking about. See, you see, he was re he was referring to after school programs. Right. Which virtually were non-existent until Mayor Dinkins brought it back with the uh, with the Beacon schools. Yeah, right. He brought it back. But in, that was uh, only some schools. And that was selected schools. Yeah. But, but back in the day, it was every virtually every elementary school. Exactly. Three to, exactly. And, and every school had music. Exactly. Exactly. So so, I feel that young people today are at a disadvantage. Absolutely. You know, and and everything that we're trying to do is to bring that back. I, and it, I refuse to accept the fact that that's in the past and can't come back uh, again. Thank you for doing this. Look, this is the big message for me from my research. Mm -hmm. Two things. One, when you bring people of different cultures together, that fuels creativity. Yep. Why did the Bronx produce more varieties of popular music than anywhere else? Because you didn't only just have African-Americans, you had Puerto Ricans and West Indians moving into neighborhoods with Jews and Italians, and everybody shared together. And the result was you, you had mambo, you had uh, doo-wop, you had bebop, then into funk, then into salsa. This was all before hip-hop. On that note, spit a beat. They call me notorious. Ph.D. I don't wear bling. I spit history. I come to the BX from the BK. MCs know that I don't play. You may be shocked to see my race. The rhymes I say don't match my race. But the jams I bring you are hardcore truth. They'll make you rock from floor to roof. I may be old, I may be white, but my flow is funky and my rhymes are tight. That's what's up. <laughs> That's dope, man. Yeah, so I, I became a rapper because when I started talking about the historical research to the students, they were saying, who's this old white guy? And then when I started rapping along with Grandmaster Flash's The Message, they thought it was the funniest thing <laughs> they'd ever seen. So you got a new project that I just read about this weekend. Uh, that, you, that you're launching as a... You want to talk about that? Okay. I now have decided I'm going to write a book mm -hmm. on the Bronx's role in shaping American popular music. That's dope. Uh, one part dealing with it 
in the age of rock and roll and mm -hmm. the other in the era of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And then a final chapter talking about the Bronx today when people like Aventura and Cardi B mm -hmm. have revolutionized popular music by doing dual language music mm -hmm. that builds on the traditions of the new immigrants coming into the Bronx. That's tremendous, man. Uh, so we'll see, you know. Uh, I'm looking forward to that new project and reading that book. And, and uh, I guess I got to catch up because I've only read one of your seven <laughs> books. So uh, I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I well, can because I think you're a great writer and uh, you, you tell great stories and you're able to uh, extract good information uh, from some of the people who, you know, it's, it's, it's important for our young people to kind of kind of tap into this. And, and where I am, it's important for them because I said, yeah, it was like this before. It could be like yeah, this again. Well, you, what you're trying to do for the youth is my dream, to okay. bring back the art, the mm -hmm. music, the mm -hmm. sports, mm -hmm. and to make people realize because that people who come from different places can make each, everybody better. My brother, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Mark. Nason, uh, and all that you do, man, and, and all that you continue to do, keep fighting, keep struggling. Pace yourself, brother. We need no, you, I know. Man. I'm old. Yeah, but pace <laughs> yourself, brother. We need you, man. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Ignite and Power Transform. My name is Hosea James Gavan II, and remember, if it's in your heart, do your part. Today's help equals tomorrow's hope. I love our youth. Thank you, and join us for our next episode. Take care. But I know all the while it's going to be okay, yes it is. Just open up your eyes, open up your eyes. the sun is soon to shine. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships. Because they knew death was better than bondage. Lift every voice and sing. Colin Powell was the first African-American appointed as the U.S. Secretary of State, as well as the first and only to serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was raised in the South Bronx on Kelly Street and attended Morris High School. Let us march on, lift every voice and sing. NBA Hall of Famer Nate Penny Archibald grew up in Patterson Houses and attended DeWitt Clinton High School. He led the Boston Celtics to NBA Championship. It's time we give back. Someone see and show someone where love.